Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Armstrong Flight Research Center. I'm uh, David McBride, Center Director. Uh, welcome. Thank you for coming out today to, to hear this great talk about the uh, 20th anniversary of our involvement in the TU-144 program. Glad to have Glenn Beaver back with us to, to talk about his experiences uh, on the program. Uh, Glenn Beaver is a former Deputy Director for Research and Engineering uh, here at the Center. Uh, previously, previously served as the Chief of the Flight Instrumentation Branch, Chief of the Flight Systems Branch here at Armstrong. He developed embedded systems for research aircraft at Armstrong for most of his 42 years at NASA. He also served as Project Chief Engineer for the Automated Aerial Refueling Project and as Chief Engineer for the C-17 Research Flight Computing Systems Project. Glenn has worked on at least 17 different aircraft platforms here at the center, including the F-104, F-16XL, CB-990, SR-71, F-15 Deke, High Deck, AFDI F-116, or AFDI F-111, uh, F-18, F-15, A-37, C-17, KC-135, C-140, Jetstar, Army OV-1, and TU-144, and a few others that aren't on the list. For 16 years, uh, Glenn was the NASA representative to the NATO AGARD Flight Test Techniques Group responsible for publications associated with flight test techniques and flight test instrumentation. Glenn authored the AGARDograph Digital Signal Conditioning for Flight Test. Between 1995 and 1999, Glenn spent much of his time in Russia as the U.S. instrumentation and on-site engineer for the T-144L high-speed research project, which he will be talking about here today. Glenn's currently retired, but holds the position of Emeritus Engineer here at NASA Armstrong, the first person to hold an Emeritus Engineering position here at the center. So please give Glenn a, a warm welcome. Thanks, David. <laughs> it wasn't mine. First of all, I'd like to uh, note my son Sam is here. He was not alive for these events, so he has a <laughs> chance to see what his old man did before he was the center of our lives. Uh, for that matter, how many people here have even heard of this project prior to the presentation? Okay. Good. <laughs> it's not a big Cold War secret. Uh, how many people actually worked on the program? See Becky back there, yeah. and uh, Bob Curry, and some other people watching, I think, from afar. Um, well, 20 years ago, on November 29th, 1996, to be exact, it was the day after Thanksgiving, so we spent Thanksgiving Day on an airplane eating Delta rubber chicken on our way to Moscow to watch the first flight of this program. Uh, it didn't break the sound barrier that day, but it broke a barrier of a different kind. It was the first American-Russian collaboration on an aeronautics flight research project. And as far as I know, it's the only one that we ever did. It hasn't happened since. So we're breaking a lot of new ground. So, I had a front row seat because um, I was uh, the boots on the ground there. Um, <clears throat> this story is a, a story partly about the program, but mostly about my experiences there, which I find the more interesting, was the most interesting part to me in trying to get this thing literally off the ground. So what was the program all about? Well, the NASA High Speed Re uh, Research Office out of Langley uh, funded a program to gather some quantitative information on a passenger class supersonic aircraft uh, with the goal of feeding that data into the design of the next generation supersonic aircraft. These things go in cycles, and this was a cycle where Boeing was once again interested in, in pursuing something like that. But there were only two vehicles that existed at the time that fit that class of aircraft, the TU-144 and the Concorde. TU-144 is known to 
Westerners sometimes is the Konkordsky, much to the chagrin of the Russians, they really hated that appellation. So what was going on in Russia at the time? The Soviet Union had just fallen a couple of years before, 1991, it ceased to exist. It was now the Russian Federation. Uh, the Russian economy was in bad shape. Um, it was a closed economy. Um, they didn't have hard currency. Uh, a lot of people had jobs but no pay. You say, well, how do they survive with no pay? Well, it was largely a barter economy. It took us a while to figure that out. Some of the people I worked with were not getting paid for the work that they were doing. But their apartments were free, things like that. Russian aviation was in bad shape also because their customer base was essentially all in Russia. And now the Russians were able to buy Western aircraft. At least that possibility was open to them. And so Tupolev, the Tupolev Design Bureau that designed the T-144 found their customer base um, severely limited. There was a lot of interest in Western, anything Western. You know, the wall had come down, the, the, the door had opened. Um, they were very happy to see people from the West. Most Russians had never been out of the country, had never met anybody from outside the country. And uh, they, needed, uh, they needed money. They were interested in buying anything Western or obtaining it, whether we're talking about blue jeans or uh, if we're talking about um, McDonald's restaurants or Pizza Hut, which they had, and TGI Friday, literally spelled that way in Cyrillic. Uh, ate at a few of those places. And even uh, Western religion, you know, the Russian uh, traditionally was Russian Orthodox. Um, under communist Russia, they had not uh, fared too well, but they still existed. A lot of the cathedrals um, had been turned into storage sheds and they were in the process of being turned back into cathedrals. That was actually a point of friction with some Russians I met. Uh, they didn't appreciate that aspect of Western coming in. But it was kind of a chaotic, chaotic time because they didn't know what was going on, uh, what was gonna happen. One Russian described it to me as Chicago in the 1920s. Uh, Moscow was a pretty secure city before that, as you might expect with a, a dictatorship and, and a hierarchical regime and secret police and so forth. Uh, all that was swept away, at least for the time. And now they had such uh, nice things as murder in the subway and Chechen separatists setting off bombs in public transportation, all in places that I frequented. So that had personal um, interest to me. So how'd the program get started? Well, the uh, Vice President Gore and uh, Prime Minister Chernomyrdin of Russia formed a joint commission to study ways of collaborating between the United States and Russia. It was a historic opportunity and one that uh, they didn't want to uh, get by them. All kinds of concerns about, you know, proliferation of nuclear materials and other things like that. But pertinent to this discussion is that in the context of that, they endorsed the T-144 LL program in 1993. And in 1994, agreements were signed with the affected parties, most of which are listed at the bottom there. Uh, NASA Langley, NASA Dryden, NASA Lewis, which is now NASA Glenn and we're now Armstrong, um, were involved. Uh, Boeing, Douglas, and Rockwell. Boeing gobbled up Douglas and Rockwell in the middle of this program, by the way. So the things were always changing. General Electric and Pratt and Whitney uh, had a, an engine test stand experiment that was run. Uh, Tupolev Design Bureau, which owned the aircraft, and IBP, which is a small company out of England that had all the rights to uh, the contract passed through to Tupolev. So 
I got involved in 1994, and I was sent to the Defense Language Institute up in Monterey, uh, which is a place where they train military personnel in all sorts of languages, um, mostly for listening posts and things like that during the Cold War. Well, the Cold War had ended, and these people were struggling a bit also uh, in what their future held. And so we contract with them to teach uh, a, a small group of us Russian. Uh, it's a 46-week course, which they crammed into four. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that was one of the more humiliating experiences of my life, being poured out of that place with an expectation of knowing something about Russian. And I did get an, an overall structure of the language, and, and it was, was helpful, but it was... Uh, uh, not optimal. The flights ran from 1996, 20 years ago this month, to April of 1999. 27 flights in all, uh, 14 of which were supersonic. And they were all flown out of Zukoski Air Base. This was a NASA program which was never flown in this country, much less this continent. They were all flown out of Zukoski. This is the only chart I'm going to show you, so take heart. But this is just to show kind of how people fit together, and this is, this is my view of it. Uh, the High Speed Research HSR office up in Langley had the program money, and they funded uh, Boeing Seattle to be the prime contractor to have a contract with the Tupolev Design Bureau, the people with the airplane, but as they say, it passed through IBP to make that happen. Uh, Dryden, so prominently in red there, um, was funded from the High Speed Research Office, but we essentially worked as a subcontractor to Boeing uh, to handle the flight instrumentation issues, uh, support, and flight test management. We had a project management office here that was managing that part of the program. Russ Barber was the, uh, was the head of that activity. Uh, after that, it got very squishy because the, the data coming off the aircraft flew, uh, came back to Dryden. Uh, we processed the data, applied the calibrations and so forth, put it in our data archive, and made it available to the to U.S. team members uh, for, an, for analysis. But essentially, all the working issues on the ground in Moscow, with the exception of a team from Langley, uh, for a cabin noise experiment uh, was all really run through Dryden and that meant largely through me because I was often the only guy, the only American on site there uh, for large parts of this program. So this is the T-144. This is a picture at Zukoski Air Base. Um, it's uh, and I think there's snow on the ground in this picture, it was, the, it was painted white twice because the first time they painted it, they did such a poor job of priming it that it was, paint was coming off in very large clumps even before it ever got in the air. So they named the plane the Moskva, which means Moscow. Um, and by the way, the, the LL designation at the end of T-144, that, that stood for Letayuzhia Laboratoria, which means flight laboratory in Russian. And I always make the distinction, this was the only LL uh, aircraft. By contrast, here's a picture of the Concorde. It's kind of a poor quality picture because this is a screen capture from a videotape that I shot in Paris this happened to be a Concorde that I flew in a year after the program ended. I had so many frequent flyer miles from flying to Russia, I got two free flights on the Concorde <laughs> going to, some meeting, to and from some meetings I had in Paris. And it's, it's a real inter interesting experience landing before you take off. It's a fast airplane. But comparing the two, the uh, airplane in red, whoops, is the T-144, and the Concorde is the one in blue. So you can see side by side, they are almost exactly the same size. The T-144 is a little bit longer, a little bit 
uh, a little bit taller. The wing shape you see is different. The placement of the engines is different. Uh, the T144 um, is a little bit heavier as well. Uh, the ceiling was a little bit higher. Uh, and even the speed was a little bit faster than the Concorde, but the Concorde had a, a bigger range. Now, when we started our program, they replaced the engines um, with the NK321 turbofans. Those were engines out of the Russian Blackjack bomber. Uh, the original engines for the T144 were no longer available. And one of my favorite stories about that, you know, after they re-engine it and change the inlet configuration and so forth to make them fit. Uh, and one of their supersonic flights, they boomed the factory where the engines were manufactured and broke a lot of windows. <laughs> so, payback. <laughs> this is a picture of the con or the excuse me, the T-144 cockpit after it was all put back together. The thing that strikes me about this is it looks to me all the world like one of our engineering simulators. Uh, it's very boxy, very functional. The aircraft itself was uh, very uh, stiff to handle. Um, but the Russians build things that, that, uh, that last. You know, just as an, a side example, tip, on a typical fighter, they put the inlets on top of the wings so it doesn't suck up all the fod on the crappy runways. And the reasoning is, we're fighting in a battle, we're not gonna have, we're gonna have battlefield conditions. We don't, we're not gonna have pristine runways. So they, they approach things often differently than, than we did. Here's another screen capture of the Concorde in flight. I actually was in the cockpit during Mach 2 flight taking this picture. <laughs> actually taking a whole series of videos of which this is a screen capture. This is, you know, a year and a half before 9-11. And a flight attendant actually came up and asked me if I wanted a tour of the cockpit in flight. And so I took my video camera, went up, and I spent a long time up there videotaping the gauges and the pilot activity and putting my hand on the, on the bulkhead, feeling the heat from the Mach 2 flight happening. Uh, where the flight engineer has his hand is close to a, a, a gap behind the console where at, at Mach, it's expanded by like, I think about an inch or inch and a half just from the, the, the friction heat from the Mach flight. So what were we actually measuring on this airplane? This is at, selected out of a whole group of experiments. This is what was selected. There are six experiments listed there. Um, and we added a, a seventh in phase two flight, the qualitative pilot assessment. Uh, but quantitatively, we had a handling qualities experiment, a boundary layer experiment. You can see we listed some pressures, like we had pressure strip of tubing on the starboard wing. We had thermocouples and RTDs and heat flux gauges on the port wing for a surface structure equilibrium test. Ask Craig Stevens about that sometime. He was, uh, that was his experiment. Uh, engine airflow and heat. Uh, slender wing ground effect, asked Bob Curry about that. He's in the back of the room there. That was an uh, experiment he was interested in, which led to some other stories. <laughs> Hopefully I'll get to later. <clears throat> so it was 722 PCM data channels. Uh, but those are, and oh, I forgot to mention the cabin noise experiment, uh, mostly inside. That was uh, principally a Langley experiment with some participation from Boeing. So we were measuring all that, as well as various air data. Um, you can see where the sensors were placed, which was pretty far aft from where the inlets were, so we had some significant um, lags due to that. They're also using Armenian sensors, and whenever I asked them what sensors they use, and they'd say Armenian, and then they'd laugh. <laughs> okay. Uh, it turns out that Armenian to them was like made in Japan was here in the 1960s. They were considered poor quality instruments and they were, they were a joke. It was no laughing matter to me because I had to analyze the data coming off of those sensors. And the characteristics of the fine sensor was a sawtooth. You'd go up in altitude, continue up in altitude, continue up in altitude. 
So the cur calibration curve was constantly changing slope. And there was hysteresis at those points, so you could not predict where it was going to happen. I had to go in by hand in the data and figure out where those points were so I could apply the calibration curve to make that change. And if that change happened in the middle of a flight test point, not optimal. So I got tired of it finally and designed my own system and put it on board so I didn't have to mess with that. This is a, a screenshot of a chart I made showing all the flights. The uh, phase one and phase two from 1996 to 99. These are all the flights where they happen. And if you can see the red on there, those are the supersonic flights. We have some gaps to handle some reconfiguration and aircraft issues uh, and converting from phase one to phase two. Right here you see US evaluation flights. That was for these two guys. Most of you will recognize the guy on the left. That's our own Gordo Fullerton. Gordo was a bulldog in making sure this flight happened. <laughs> he really wanted to fly this airplane and, um, and, and really pushed it. Uh, Rob Rivers is the other pilot there. He's out of Langley. Uh, you can see the degree of his commitment also because you might notice that he's sporting a cane there. The reason for that was a month or two prior to that, he broke his leg. <clears throat> and he was not 100% healed, frankly, and hobbled around on that cane. But he managed to convince doctors on both sides of the Atlantic that he was fit enough to fly. <laughs> and remember what I said about the stiff handling of the T-144. It was not an easy aircraft to fly if you weren't 100%. But he did. So what's coming next is a video. It's about three and a half minutes long, and uh, it's, it's this video that was shot by, uh, 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 mostly by Lori Losey here. We sent her, uh, Jim Ross and her to Moscow for these flights to get us some decent pictures. Um, and this is Gordo's first flight. There's a takeoff. You can see the, the Snoopy ears there deployed, the winglets. That's something the Concorde did not have, but they had a CG problem with this aircraft, and they had to put those on there to balance things out. And you'll also notice the droop nose. Someone called this the sad dragon face. <laughs> but it's drooped down to 12 and a half degrees so the pilots can see the runway on takeoff and landing. Something else the Concorde also shared. It was a beautiful aircraft. But that aircraft was, uh, this particular one was the 17th off the assembly line. It was the last TU-144 built. Uh, they had like 82 flight hours. It was retired in 1989. From commercial service, it retired, I think, about 79. But they, they did some other testing up until 89. And then it sat there. So there were no flyable aircraft at the time we started the program. And the Russians resurrected this one. And they had high hopes that we would continue the program and make more use out of that. He's coming in for a landing here. Now, this aircraft, or one of his sister ships, famously crashed in the 1973 Paris Air Show under rather controversial circumstances. You can Google it on the internet sometime and find out all the different uh, opinions about that. But it pretty well killed its commercial um, uh, viability, at least in the Western world. And it spent the rest of its commercial life flying within the Soviet Union from Siberia and back again. The handling qualities, by the way, are considerably different expectations between the US pilots and the Russian pilots. Um, when you talked, to, we, Borisov, the chief pilot of T-144, came out here and flew an F-18. They actually chased the SR-71 in one flight. And Borisov said, well, I've, I've chased an SR once before, but it was over the Baltic and I couldn't catch it. 
But he said the F-18, its sensitivity was just way too sensitive an aircraft. And he talked to the American pilots flying the T-144. He said, the thing handled like a truck. And the, yeah, notice he hangs on to his jacket through all this. <laughs> this, this is a very Russian scene here. But the, uh, the Russians also said during one of the toastings that the T-144 flew like a good fighter should. So the whole expectation level between the two uh, uh, countries' pilots was just entirely different. Okay. So as Paul Harvey used to say, now for the rest of the story. <laughs> That's pretty much it for the program. What are some of the challenges we faced there? Well, import and export was a big one. Uh, we didn't do a lot of importing and exporting in those days, and we certainly didn't do much to Russia. There was some space station activity, but NASA didn't really have a hard and fast policy about how this was supposed to happen. I found myself on the phone to the guy at headquarters responsible for this a lot, sort of making it up as we went along. This is what I want to do, how do I do it, kind of thing. Um, on top of that, the Russians didn't have a good set of consistent policies, and they were constantly changing things, mostly when you weren't aware of it. Some of the items like the, the, our GPS that was used in the ground effect study, uh, we wanted to keep uh, limitations removed that are normally have to be in place when we export from the country. And it took 17 levels of signatures, including the Assistant Secretary of State signature, to allow us to export that unit to Russia for this program. Uh, long distance travel was an obvious, obviously a, an issue. It was a 7,000 miles, great circle distance from here. Uh, it was an 11-hour time zone difference, which meant there was no common workday between here and there. Uh, the language and communication was certainly a big one. Uh, few Russians on the program knew any English, and none of them that I worked with did, which meant given my meager Russian skills, I worked with a full-time technical interpreter. It was, was quite good. Um, any Russian that was on the program that spoke English found themselves off the program pretty, pretty quickly because their skills were in short supply in the rest of the Russian industry. And that was a skill that they could market and actually get paid for. <clears throat> Uh, interpersonal relationships, it was uh, initially, a initially at least a challenge in um, getting to know the Russians and uh, develop a, enough trust that we could move forward with the project. And it was also a, an issue at home because if you're spending that much time overseas, you know, ask any servicemen on overseas deployment how, how easy it is to maintain personal relationships back at home. So that could be a challenge also. Zukovsky Air Base, um, <clears throat> remember I talked about how abysmal the Russian economy was? You, you square that and that's the infrastructure problems at the air base itself. To give you some idea, when we first arrived out there and someone uh, asked to use the restroom, they pointed to the woods <laughs> because the restrooms were in really really bad shape. You know, the lights were out, the plumbing was gone. Um, you were glad the lights were out because you didn't want to see what was in there. Um, Russians were embarrassed about some of these things. Um, you know, the, the dogs roaming the hallways and leaving little presents everywhere was uh, when some foreign press made, made note of this in the early days, the Russians were not amused. Um, heat. Uh, Russia is not known for being a balmy place. <laughs> and when it's 40 below and you have no heaters, you know it's 40 below. Um, they had heaters, but they had no fuel for them. They couldn't afford it. So in the laboratory, we had a homebrew space heater, which would have our safety people cringe. That was the only source of heat in the laboratory in, in the wintertime. And even the phone lines, this is in the days, uh, you know, mid-90s, before cell phones were ubiquitous. Um, just getting a phone line between Zukovsky Air Base to Moscow, 20 miles away, 
we had to walk uh, three buildings over and up about two flights of stairs into a back office and get a phone line which had a lot of static problems. That was her phone line to Moscow. Uh, Boeing had hired a Russian um, to be sort of their eyes and ears. Uh, they issued him a cell phone and he was the most popular guy on the airbase. Uh, structurally, the Russians are very hierarchical, and many of us were using a, used to operating in a more matrix-type environment. Uh, Western business practices, the things that are just de rigueur to us, uh, were often not the way the Russians worked. Things like you know, contracts, statements of work, managers wanting details of schedules, deliverables, and costing. Just try to get that information out of the Russians. You know, you ask them what the schedule is. They say, we'll fly in March. Okay. Any problems? No. No problems until the end of February <laughs> when you'd find out what the problems actually were. This drove our managers crazy, and I was usually the guy on the ground that had to deal with that. Um, Russian business practices, by the same token, they, they largely operated, in my experience, through summaries of discussion. And this was something that at the end of each, uh, each series of meetings or vis visit, uh, you would write out that everybody would agree to, yes, this is what we talked about, this is what we're going to do next. So it was sort of an incremental contract what their next priority was. And I wrote those things. We didn't really understand initially how important they were to the Russians and what force of law they had with them. But we, we came to understand that pretty quickly. And it was a measure of trust that initially we would write those things out, both in Russian and English, we would both read those, we would sign the other copies, and after a while the interpreter would just read, the, translate the English version to Russian verbally, and the Russians, and we would all sign the English copy. Then it got to a point where Russians would say, you know, if you put the signature page by itself, if we had to make any changes, we wouldn't have to re-sign it. <laughs> So since I was writing him, I was okay with that. <laughs> and I found a lot of Russians would come in and they would sign a signature page and then leave without ever hearing what the summary of discussion said. And that's when I knew that I had their trust. August was a lost month because of holidays. Weather was often bad in, in the wintertime. Uh, the work pace was slower than we would have liked it to be. Uh, the technology was, um, I've got a story about technology later, um, but let's just say it was uh, probably 20 or 30 years behind what we were used to seeing. And there's always the issue of flight research versus flight tests and the quality of data. It's no different there. Now, I can't have a discussion about Russia without talking about vodka. <laughs> I don't have time to talk a lot about vodka, but uh, vodka was central to, uh, to toasting, and toasting was central to the way Russians operate. Uh, very, very cultural, but uh, spilled a great deal over into business. And virtually every meeting that I ever went to, uh, every luncheon, every snack, vodka was available, <laughs> and everybody was expected to toast. Um, and toasting in the Russian tradition is where everybody in turn is expected to stand up and you know, utter some piece of uh, poetic wisdom uh, to commemorate the occasion or something. They could toast whatever they wanted to, but they had to, had to come up with something. And so the larger the meeting you had, <laughs> the more toasting you had because everybody had to toast. And I once saw the, the Glavny constructor, the chief designer, Professor Pukov, knock back 21 shots in a row for every person that was in the room. Now, after observing this in the initial days of the program, when the, uh, the uh, American manager would, would come out and not to be outdone, they would be, you know, right in line. The next day, they couldn't function. <laughs> And I did some fast thinking. So, you know, I'm going to be here a lot. I've got actual work to do. 
I can't afford to do that. So I just set the ground rule from the beginning that I didn't drink. Now, the Russians thought that was kind of peculiar and maybe a little suspicious. <laughs> I mean, after all, if you don't want to get drunk, you must be a spy, right? <laughs> um, but they got used to it. And it, was a, it was a source of amusement. Um, but they tolerated it. And uh, I still toasted with water, which looks just like vodka. In fact, there's only one letter difference in the Russian word for it, voda versus vodka. <laughs> Not that I was fooling anybody. But nevertheless, you went through the ritual of toasting and so forth. Um, that, by the way, is Zolotoy Koloso. It's golden ring vodka. That B is actually a V. There's a lot of interesting differences like that. This was a dinner, my final dinner with Professor Pukov, who's sitting there at the end with a coat and tie and his wife sitting next to him. It was the first time we'd met his wife in this entire program. They didn't usually mix personal with professional that way. Um, the thing that sticks out of my mind most about this dinner was uh, when uh, Professor Pukov's wife turned to him and berated him for not being more like me. <laughs> <laughs> he drinks too much. I don't drink at all. You should be more like him. What do you do with that? <laughs> Smile and keep quiet, mostly. Um, but Russians would also th say things like, you're every Russian woman's dream, a man that doesn't drink. Uh, but then they have to ask himself, why isn't he drinking? So, so, so that's, that's vodka. Technical challenges. Well, remember, this is the mid-90s. Um, internet was still kind of in its infancy. There wasn't. There was, it was there, but the entire data link for the, all of the American teams in Moscow was a one and a half megabit per second data link, a T1 link. That's not enough band, you know, by contrast, I checked last night, my, my internet at home is 70 megabits per second. This was one and a half for all of the city of, of uh, Americans in the team. So there was not, wasn't bandwidth to support web access, so we didn't have that. When I transferred data back, it was at 10 kilobits per second. It literally took all night to transfer a, a, a flight of 120 megabytes uh, back to the machines here. The only email I had originally was through a local internet service provider. Uh, telephone costs of the hotel were $7.50 a minute. Now, the per diem at the time for overseas was $7 a day. <laughs> and the phone system, uh, as I mentioned before, was not optimal in the first place. In fact, if we had telecons between Russia and here, it usually took 10 or 15 minutes just to set up the telecon. And then every half hour, like clockwork, it would drop off and you have to start the process all over again. And that was outside of the common workday as well. Uh, in data processing, this one fell heavily on me because I received the data, uh, I received the calibration files. Um, they did some funny things with their data using uh, what's called ratiometric calibrations because the power supplies were of such poor quality that you had to measure the power supply at the same time as the data so you could ratio those things to make sure you knew what the output was. We hadn't done that in probably, I don't know, 30 years here. We just improved our power supplies. Uh, so none of our calibration systems would deal with that. Uh, the, the data that I got on disk was not um, uh, compatible with the way we did things in our range. And so bit by bit, I found that I replaced the entire Dryden system with programs that I wrote data coming off the aircraft, doing a software decommutation to dealing with the embedded system time, which by the way, ran backwards sometimes, um, to uh, selecting the calibrations, to uh, formatting them in Compress4 format, applying the calibrations to that, and then depositing it directly into FDAS. So from end to end, I strike from the Russians through my programs into our archive where it sits, still sits today. 
So that was a challenge. For some reason, when the Russians came to Williamsburg, we visited Langley, took him to Williamsburg, I couldn't get him into the stocks. <laughs> so I took one for the team and had a picture taken that way. But we took him to Langley. The first thing they wanted to do was go to Walmart. <laughs> one guy wanted to get a pres for some prescription glasses. Everybody else is running around buying blue jeans and shoes like they're going out of style. They're actually just going into style in Russia. Well, you want to try those on? No, it doesn't matter. They were just buying them for family and friends and you know, maybe to sell. Uh, we took them to Disneyland and uh, Universal Cities when they came out here in the beach and some of those kind of places. And uh, Wilson Vandiver, who was my immediate predecessor on this project before he retired, uh, was driving and uh, uh, Sergei Karabanov, our interpreter, pops open a can of beer in the back seat. And Wilson about came unglued. You can't do that. Can't do what? You, you can't open a beer in a, in a moving vehicle. Well, why not? But we have a, we have a, a, a rule against, we have a law against, uh, against that. Well, why? <laughs> what kind of democracy is this? You know, just, just to understand it. You know. We'd be driving out uh, in, in the desert here. You come to a stop sign, and you stop, right? And the Russians would say, there's nobody coming. Why did you stop? <laughs> it's a stop sign. They, they just couldn't understand that. And, and after, after watching driving in Moscow sometime later, I could understand their confusion. <laughs> And then we went to Paris because the, uh, they had selected a French instrumentation system, the, the Damien uh, 5, uh, which is manufactured in Masse Palosso, about south of Paris. And we spent two weeks there uh, with the Russians learning the system at the same time. And so they're kind of neutral territory. Uh, this is some of the Russians uh, sitting with me on the couch. Uh, Ludmila in the center is one of those English speakers that didn't last long with the program because, well, she spoke English. Um, Alexander Studikov, right there, was my counter instrumentation counterpart. Sergei Karabanov, one of our interpreters. Sergei's smile says it all. <clears throat> uh, he was a character. He was a former Russian army major. You ever ask him how many languages he speaks? He says, I speak one, Russian. The rest I interpret. <laughs> <laughs> but that was, it was interesting to get to know the Russians. This is the first time I had met many of them, uh, the, of the working level people, because most of the working level Russians were not allowed to travel to the United States. Uh, but in class, the class is taught by a Frenchman speaking English, and the interpreter uh, would translate the English to Russian. And sometimes when I would ask a question in English, the Frenchman didn't understand what I was talking about. He didn't understand me. So the Russian interpreter would translate my English to English <laughs> that the Frenchman could understand. So he said we should pay him extra for that. <laughs> As we're walking around Paris, uh, one of the Russians, not, not pictured here, was going on about things he observed. He'd never been out of the Soviet Union before, and he was just buffaloed by some of the stuff he saw. He'd see a patch of grass, like a 10 by 10 foot lawn in somebody's front yard, and he'd say, what a waste of space. They should plant vegetables there. What are they gonna eat in the wintertime? Gives you some idea of what they were used to. And then it was on to Moscow. The, um, I spent, I made 19 trips there in that four year period. Average stay was about two weeks, so about every other month I was there for half the month. Uh, a total time I spent there was eight months. I hit every month of the year at least once. It was, uh, this is a picture in Moscow, so you can get an idea of the, you see the, the clean car sitting there. By the way, it was, uh, it was a, there was a law in the city that you had to keep your car clean. 
There's also a law in the city that you couldn't wash your car in public. Um, Seatbelts were required. The fact that none of the seatbelts worked was immaterial, I guess. But, but we'd be driving down the road, and there'd be a policeman standing on the side of the road with a white stick. If he pointed to the car, they were supposed to pull over. The driver would nudge me. He'd throw his seatbelt over his, his lap, pass the policeman, then throw the seatbelt off. It didn't work anyway. But there's no place I've ever driven that I needed a seatbelt more than <laughs> driving around Moscow. I mean, if the, if the streets were clogged, they just get out and drive down the opposing traffic lanes. <laughs> so what was a typical daily life there like? Um, I stayed at a very nice hotel. Uh, it was very expensive. Uh, one time I investigated getting a, um, a, a local uh, sort of subletting an apartment, which I got it done for much, much cheaper. But there was a catch. I had to do it in cash. It's really much a cash and carry economy. So I went to a legal office and asked them, I said, I can save the government a lot of money if I just go in these, but I have to do it in cash. And they looked at me and said, don't try to save the government money. It just confuses them. <laughs> so I abandoned that approach. But frankly, I needed the telecommunications that was growing up at this particular hotel anyway to do my job. But it was a very nice hotel and had a very you know, opulent breast, uh, breakfast. They had people playing harps in the upper tier. A lot of out-of-work musicians running around Moscow. You'd, you'd see string quartets playing in the subways you know, for, for money. Uh, their attitude about drivers was interesting. Uh, to them, a driver of a car was like a captain of the ship. You know, what the captain said goes. You know, wherever he decided to go and when he decided to go, that was, that was his job. We viewed it somewhat differently. We hired the driver and the vehicle to go where we wanted him to go. And so sometimes they come running in and say, the driver wants to leave, we say so. <laughs> um, he just have to wait. Um, I often found myself what I call holding court because as, as a liaison, I would carry requests from the American team and uh, issues and requests from the Russian team back. And so I'd sit in a conference room and sort of single file, one after the other, Russians would come in and uh, kind of with hat in hand and, and give me their request or give me some information I'd request. I kind of felt like the godfather. What can I do for you? But I got to talk to a lot of interesting people that way, uh, people that had designed systems on the original T-144, like guy from Rockwell was looking at the fuel system. They asked me, oh, how's the fuel system laid out? So I asked Tupolev, and they sent in the guy to design the fuel system. And he sits down with a pencil, pencil and paper and sketches out the whole system and how the fuel was transferred. And I translated that as best I could and sent it back to, uh, back to the States. Russian chocolate was a particular favorite of mine, and they very quickly discovered this. I guess I gave it away when I said, where do you get this marvelous chocolate? Because I wanted to buy it myself, and they never would tell me. But they always took great delight in making sure that that chocolate was available on a table wherever I was sitting. And I said the hotel was expensive, uh, and it was. Most things in the city for a foreigner were very expensive. Um, but it was a two-tiered structure. They had, uh, say, if you went to a museum, the price for a local was probably 10 times less than it was for a foreigner. And one time we're in a museum, and my interpreter looks at me and says, you look Russian. Keep quiet. <laughs> and goes over and buys two local tickets for us for the, for the museum. But speaking of museums, one day I was in a museum by myself. They have two costs there. You can go into a museum with a camera for one price or without a camera for a lower price. I didn't feel like paying extra money, so I, I left my camera. I was up on the second or third floor, and I spied over in the corner this pile of junk that I noticed there was Air Force markings on. So I went over and looked at it. It was Francis Gary Powers U2 
For those of you that don't know, that was a plane that was famously shot down in 1960 over Soviet Russia, great to the embarrassment of the Eisenhower administration. I had occasion just a couple of days ago to talk to a guy here in town that had met Francis Gary Powers, and he asked him, why didn't you bite down on the cyanide capsule? And he said, it's kind of permanent, don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> This is a picture of some of the people I worked with in the laboratory at Zukoski. Um, that was invariably a pleasant experience other than the lack of heat uh, because the people I worked with were very professional and very pleasant. We got along very well. Never, never had an issue with working with them. As, I, as I've often discovered in, in my career, you get the managers out of the way that people tend to work together pretty well. And uh, at the time, I was not a manager. I was an Indian surrounded by managers from the US team when they were there for drinking vodka. But otherwise, they were back home and didn't bother me. Here's some of the, some of the US team. You can guess who one of the Americans is <laughs> wearing the Purdue t-shirt. That's uh, Steve Rizzi. Uh, Don Gallagher, Keith Harris, and myself, they were here for the cabin noise experiment. I gotta talk a little bit about some of the key players. Um, bottom right-hand corner is Bill Adams. He was a program manager from Rockwell. He was often called the father of the T-144 program because I gather it was his uh, vision and foresight that led to the creation of this program in the first place. Our own Ken Soleil, who was the Dryden director at the time, uh, very material in, in making sure this came about. And the Globny constructor himself, Alexander Pukov, the chief designer of uh, Tupolev ANTK, which is basically says joint stock company, uh, he was the, the spark plug that made things happen from the Russian side. He was a, one of the designers of the original TU-144. Um, uh, leader, diplomat, uh, vodka drinker, you know, he was, he was a force to be reckoned with. But another force to be reckoned with was Judith DePaul. Uh, Judith was the president and CEO of that small company I talked about, IBP. It's actually run out of England, but she was from New York. Judith had a very interesting background. She started her career in the show business as a dancing matchbox in a cigarette commercial when she was seven years old. Um, she later was an opera singer at the New York Met, performed with Pavarotti. Um, I think did some shows with uh, Placido Domino or because she moved into production and produced um, some, some plays, musicals, two of which she got an Emmy for. I've seen them at her place in England. And, but she also was brought into Russia by Armand Hammer and introduced to a lot of people in the 1980s. And she was well positioned after the Soviet Union um, fell uh, to look at some business opportunities there. And she managed to get all of the rights to Western contracts with Tupolev, which is why we had to pass through her company. She got all the film rights to the Russian Film Archive and made a documentary on uh, Russia's involvement in World War II during the program. Um, she was first and foremost a businesswoman, who was always looking for an opportunity. One of the things she liked to say was, is there money in it? Um, but she was very much a dominant presence, and I think because of her show business background, she knew how to make an entrance. Whenever Judith came into a room, everybody knew Judith was there, and she was the, the, the dominant presence there. She once told me that she never crashed through the glass ceiling. She landed on top of it. <laughs> and that is the best description of Judith that I think I've ever heard from her own lips. And by the way, all the interpreters that I had worked for her. We had a contract with, uh, with them for that. This just shows a typical office of Zukowski. Um, 
very reminiscent, I think, of a, of a, of a 1950s feel here to me. Uh, some key players in there, Borisov, the chief pilot, is in the center, the chief, uh, the chief engineer, the chief instrumentation engineer, the chief designer, and I'll be mentioning this character a little bit later. A couple of shots on the aircraft to show I actually did do some work on the aircraft when I was there. By the way, just about every American that came there wanted to buy one of these Russian hats. I never did. <laughs> I found them you know, too bulky and too hard to, to deal with. With my good old ski cap, I could just stuff it in my pocket and I was good to go. Talk a little bit about safety at Zukovsky uh, in particular. I kept losing equipment on the workbench and I was noticing some uh, body sensor alarms going off, so I measured the voltage difference between the power outlet and the ground on the bench. It was 90 volts. This is not good. <laughs> but it goes to the infrastructure again. Talked about the seat belts already. The, 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 the briefings were what I call dog and pony shows. Uh, if we went to a flight readiness review, that consisted of a bunch of people sitting around a table saying, we're good to go, we're good to go, yet problem, no problem. And it wasn't like one of our flight readiness reviews or tech briefs where we're trying to dig in to, to make sure everybody understands what they don't understand and have thought about what they need to think about. That was not transparent to us. In fact, I was sent one time, or, or um, commissioned by the managers here to find out more about that. Because they said that you know, they weren't getting the schedule and costing information, all that kind of stuff. And after asking the chief engineer some questions for a while, he says, I'm surprised you don't know this stuff. And one of the other Russians pointed out that they never invite me to the meetings. How am I supposed to know about that? Said, okay. Still never invited me to the meetings. <laughs> This was a real FRR. A bunch of Russians gathered by the aircraft, making the go, no, no go uh, decisions in close communication. Of course, it was cold. Uh, a few items about some things that were off nominal. Um, I mentioned on the starboard wing we had strip of tubing for measuring pressures. Um, we had one of those come off at Mach 2 and peel back and wrap around the uh, pressure rakes at the aft end of the aircraft. I had a cockpit window crack. And then there's things that I consider off nominal. You know, paying for a quarter million pounds of pool with a suitcase of cash, literally, is not something we typically do around here. <laughs> the very first time I arrived in Moscow, I got as far as passport control and uh, the passport agent was asking me a bunch of things in Russian that I didn't understand. And they finally pointed over to this section on the floor, this little square. So I went over and stood in this square thinking, now what? You know, my interpreter is on the other side of the security boundary. You know, any other American I was with was also over there. I was by myself, had no idea what, what the issue was. Um, my interpreter finally managed to talk his way past the security boundary and come over and ask the passport agent, what the problem was. And it turned out that the spelling of my name on my visa was different than the spelling of my name on their list, which isn't a big surprise because it was all transliterated from our alphabet to Cyrillic. And there's a number of ways you can do that. And they just chose two different ways of doing it. And then Sergei followed all that up by asking the passport agent for a date. <laughs> and that pretty well defined Sergei. I wasn't going to core drill that one too much. <laughs> OK. Um, some things scared me a bit. And top on the list is what I call the GPS incident. I told Bob Curry a few months ago that he nearly landed me in jail, and he didn't know what he was talking about. But what happened was, one morning I'm sitting in my hotel reading the Moscow Times. It's an English language paper. 
And there's this little article there um, about a Qualcomm engineer that had just been arrested for doing a GPS survey, survey outside of a former Soviet military base. <clears throat> My blood kind of ran cold because I was doing exactly the same thing, except I was on a former Soviet military base. <laughs> this was to survey the field so that we could get you know, data for the uh, ground effect. We know exactly how far above the airfield the plane was because the Russian radar was, uh, was crappy. Um, now, this is one of those cases where the Russians made up a new rule. He was officially arrested for having, uh, not having the, the right import license for his GPS unit. There was no such thing. <laughs> At least it wasn't at the time that we imported our units. So that had me kind of sweating there for a while, wondering when the other shoe was going to drop. They eventually re released him, and not much more is made out of that. But other GPS issues I don't have time to go into. The streets of Moscow, as I say, were problematic. There were two classes of drivers, the professional drivers and the amateur drivers. And the amateur drivers usually had no training whatsoever. And both types of drivers drove very aggressively. One of our drivers, turns out he was the driver of the former head of the KGB. In fact, he was the driver that drove Solzhenitsyn out of the country when he was expelled some years before that. Um, one day I was sitting in the office of uh, Mr. Speer uh, having lunch. We often had lunch in his office. He was not in attendance that day. And we're talking about something, and I commented that there was a guy back at Dryden that reminded me of Mr. Speer, only Bill was a redneck and Spear was a communist. And the Russians got big saucer eyes and said, how did you know Spear was a communist? <laughs> There's a picture of Lenin hanging on his wall. <laughs> Thought that was a clue. And there's always cultural mistakes that, that you run across, uh, most of them small, uh, but some of them larger than others. The, um, we were in, uh, we, we had dinner at our interpreter's house one day. This was the first and only time we ever was invited into anybody's home there. Um, and we arrived, we decided it'd be a good idea to, uh, to take some roses for the hostess. And so we bought some flowers, I think it was a dozen roses, and our interpreter said, you know, it's bad luck to give someone an even number of flowers. No, didn't know that. So we started to enter and shake hands. He said, oh, it's bad luck to shake hands across the threshold. You kind of come inside to do that. Okay, didn't know that either. Um, refusing to toast, obviously, is a faux pas. Um, we were visiting uh, a monastery one weekend out at uh, uh, Zagorsk, and we got a tour by an English-speaking Russian Orthodox nun. And at one point, we're standing in, inside uh, the cathedral, and she starts admonishing us because several of our members were standing there with our hands in our pockets. And by way of example, she says, you know, if you were talking to your boss, would you stand there with your hands in your pockets? Okay. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> and she was aghast. I thought Americans had more manners than that. So, just for the record, I wasn't standing here with my hands in my pockets, but, but you just never know. And, and the, Wilson, uh, in, in the earlier days, uh, I stayed at, back in Tsukovsky, or at uh, Tupolev one day, and uh, he went back to the hotel. He was on the subway talking to our interpreter, and a woman gets up and starts berating Wilson for something in Russian. He had no idea what it was, and she got off, and a young man comes up and does the same thing. Wilson had a heck of a time getting the interpreter to tell him what the problem was, and she said, well, she was unhappy with you crossing your legs on the subway. But he never would tell us why. We had a few guesses, maybe it was showing, showing the sole of his foot, or maybe it was taking up too much space, I don't know, but it was apparently a no-no that 
one of those unwritten rules that foreigners are just not going to know about. One day, I was in a telecon in Russia talking to the U.S. team, and um, Norm Princeton, some of you might know, has worked uh, uh, projects uh, in conjunction with us later. He was doing a handling qualities assessment uh, for Douglas, and I knew that he had to coordinate with the Russians for flight cars, and I said, Norm, if you want to come to Moscow to coordinate your flight cars, now is a good time to come. And the deputy program manager at Boeing jumped all over my case. He said, I don't know how they do things at NASA, but at Boeing, we let our managers make those kind of decisions. Okay, so I said, well, I don't know how they do things at Boeing, but at NASA, we like to give our managers information on which to base their decisions. And that's all I was doing. You know, I wasn't a manager at the time. I certainly wasn't Norm's manager, but I was the guy on the ground that had the intelligence, the information, and I was passing that on. I often found it easier to work with the Russians than to work with Boeing on this project. <laughs> To, to be fair, they, uh, they were the prime contractor, and so it was their responsibility to, to run this program. But they weren't sending people over to actually do that. And one thing I discovered with the Russians, unless you're there, your job has lower priority. And I was the guy that was there, so I was passing on the information. Uh, it was often because of the import-export issues, it was hard to uh, send things back for servicing. So on at least one occasion, I was trained by the factory to do the servicing on our flight recorder unit myself, because it was easier to send me there to do it on site. And as many times as I was there, my, my participation was still kind of an event. It wasn't just seamless, oh, you're here again, let's go do stuff. There's a bit of ceremony often involved. You had, didn't have direct access to people. And I already talked about the issues of keeping warm. But you can see how they kept warm. This was a very common winter garb uh, for the women. And there was a reason for it. Here's a typical lunch at Zukowski. And uh, you probably can't tell, but that's Donna Gallagher beneath the burka there. <clears throat> um, completely wrapped, including gloves, just to keep warm at our, at our literally cold lunch. There were some positive things about this. And uh, back in those days, the airline baggage limit was larger than it is now. And I usually used it to the mask because I was transporting all kinds of stuff back and forth. Airlines still serve food. Uh, security was such that I could carry bottles of water from California to, to Moscow and not have it confiscated. Um, I even often got upgraded to business class automatically. That was a bit dicey in the early days because the government had rules against that that were changing at the time. In fact, the uh, frequent flyer miles rules changed during the midst of this as well. I, I accumulated the miles without ever expecting I'd be, I'd be able, able to use them. I ended up using it for the Concorde flight, but that was officially a business trip because I was going to Moscow for a, I mean to a Paris for a meeting. The 11 hour time difference allowed me to take advantage of a double shift. I'd get information to Zhukovsky and, and uh, Tupolev in Moscow, go back to my hotel, write emails, go to bed, wake up in the morning. Meanwhile, the people in the States have had a chance to work uh, their, their normal work day, I'd take the answers and go back to, to Tupelo. So that, if you handle that right, that worked out rather well. It also gave me the ability, out of necessity, to operate pretty autonomously. Um, there was nobody to talk to and limited ways in which to do that. I couldn't call them on the phone initially. They wouldn't be there, first of all. Second was prohibitively expensive initially. Um, Emails, I was going through a local ISP, so I had to be somewhat careful about what information you were, were transferring back and forth. Um, I was the only guy there, so I got to make decisions, somewhat to Boeing's chagrin. So what I do on the weekends, one of my favorite pictures, I took this picture. This is a park just a few blocks from my hotel. 
the Russians were very fond of walking the park uh, with the family and with the you know, sledge, as you see. Very pleasant, if cold, environment. And I was a frequent visitor to this place, the Ismailov Flea Market. I would take the Moscow subways across town, and you could buy everything there from Matroshka dolls to surplus military hardware. Not wanting to deal with customs issues with the surplus military hardware, I opted for the Matroshka dolls. And I became quite adept at picking out good quality Matroshka, those are stacking dolls, um, sold by the artists of those things, the people that actually painted them, um, uh, good quality for a low cost. I could go to the same, I could find the same dolls in the Goom department store in downtown Moscow for probably five times the cost. And to get there, I had to use the metro. Um, the metro stations themselves were rather opulently appointed. There was a lot of marble columns and statues and sometimes chandeliers. The subway cars themselves were very boxy and functional and blue. Um, and the markings, um, unless you could read Cyrillic, you had no clue where to go in the subways because all you had was just a stack of names about this long in the Cyrillic alphabet that listed the stops. If you had some kind of a map, they were listed as color-coded, but none of the color coding ever made it into the subway itself. And I think this was initially a security feature to the Russians. They didn't want foreigners wandering around knowing where to go. You know, putting things like military bases on maps was a foreign concept to them as well. And you might have seen St. Basil's Cathedral at the end of, of Red Square. It's a very famous icon. Okay, we had, we had good technical interpreters. Um, I'll mention one story where that didn't work out so well. Uh, I was doing a summary discussion at the end of um, one of my visits and looking at a shipping document that was listed where I, where I had left some things. And I read off some items and uh, the interpreter said something in Russian and the, and the Russians got this confused look on their face. So I said it again and I listened to what the interpreter was saying and I knew just enough to recognize he wasn't saying it right. So in desperation, I broke into Russian myself. Anybody here speak Russian? Good. <laughs> but, but he said, um, which means items one, two, and three are Zukovsky, and four, five, and six are here in Moscow. And they got another startled expression on their face. And from then on, they never were quite sure how much Russian I understood. <laughs> and, and they all handle it different ways. You know, some guys would go off and whisper in the corner. <laughs> Other guys would come right up to my face and start chattering away in Russian, assuming I knew everything they were talking about, which was not often the case. Um, Briefly, the Germans sent a film team out for three days. They followed me around and, and did a documentary, kind of like a, a reality show before there was such a thing, in which I figured prominently. Um, I have a copy of it only because it, it aired in Germany and a colleague of mine, uh, his daughter saw it, recognized my name and hit the record button. And so I got a, got a copy of that in German. Um, The uh, calibration lab, they were, they were giving me a, a tour of how they calibrated pressure transducers. And at the end of it, the uh, interpreter, or the, uh, the, uh, the head of the lab, the aforementioned communist, turned to me and asked, so tell me, are we behind? And I was thinking, heck yeah. <laughs> but what I said was, I started my career at NASA in the pressure calibration lab, my first job was to design an automatic uh, program for automating the process of calibrating pressure transducers. And some of the stuff I had just seen there was antiquated when I arrived at NASA over 20 years before that. But what I told them was, well, we do an automated process, but what I've discovered is the technicians have often lost a touch with the physics of the situation. And the technician drew herself up proudly and said, I understand the physics of the situation. 
Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> and just quickly, uh, Mark Twain, I discovered, was a popular favorite author in Russia, and I let it slip one day that he was actually a distant relative of mine, and that got them all excited. <laughs> Uh, to the extent that the next day they brought in copies of Russian works of Mark Twain and had me autograph them. <laughs> and I say, but I'm only a distant relative. I say, well, don't put that part. <laughs> so I use my toasting experience to say, uh, from the banks of the, Mo uh, the Mississippi River to the banks of the Moscow, we send you greetings. And sign my name to it. So they were very happy. Now, some of these, you tell me what they mean, <laughs> but they were things that uh, were uttered. <laughs> I was asked to help them with a Windows problem one day, and remember the little Remember the little flying folder of copying and a countdown? Well, the counter, counter would get down to zero and sit there while the flyer, full hole was still flying. And I said, wait for it. Sure enough, about 30 seconds later, it finished. And that's when one Russian said that line. <laughs> On a more serious note, one of the conversations I had with my interpreter, you know, they were still trying to figure out how things worked. They knew how things worked under communism, whether they liked it or not, they knew how it worked. Under capitalism, they didn't know what was going on, but one interpretation was there is, it's every man for himself, they're expected to do their worst and not, not work for the common good. So that was a very interesting observation on the part of someone who grew up in that system. That's Mr. Speer, the communist there, and Mr. Sablov. So, i try to wrap it up here. The, what happened afterwards? The, Boeing decided that engine ne technology just wasn't there to, to support a next generation of supersonic transport in, in the late 90s. They, they couldn't make the economic case, and at the same time, the high-speed research program ended for various reasons, uh, one of which uh, I gather is that it looked like Boeing was thinking NASA was going to do all the research for them, so they cut back the research program. And, NASA looked at Boeing cutting back the research program, so this is no longer of interest to them, so we cut back ours. Uh, the space station uh, was, uh, was way over budget, and if they got the appropriation line stuff sorted out, I gather that the, all the money kind of went that direction. But I will say that these things go in cycles, and as you know, re, supersonic overlab is, uh, overland has a renewed emphasis. Um, and I think that uh, a lot of data gathered on this program could still be quite useful in that. And we still have it. And as the instrumentation is here, I know how to interpret it. Um, but we did learn a great deal, uh, gather a great deal of quantitative data. And I personally learned how to work with Russians and hone down some of my diplomatic skills, like in the calibration lab. Uh, it was an opportunity to build trust with the Russians, which I think we did pretty effectively. Um, and it was a unique experience to work in an environment. I, I'd done a lot of traveling before this, but I had never really been in a place where it was hard to find someone who spoke my language. And I knew more of the local language than they knew of mine, so it kind of forced the issue to, to use it a bit more. And it was an experience of a lifetime. When I left the program, um, when the program ended, some of my Russian colleagues put together this collage and signed it to, to give to me, which I appreciated. Uh, they also gave me a medal. This is actually the first medal I ever got. I, I got a few from NASA subsequently, but this is the first medal I was ever awarded. And it was for excellence in the field of aviation technology. Now the kicker, to the, the reason I show you this is because they told me I was the, only the second foreigner they had ever given this medal to. I know who the first one was? The head of North Korea. <laughs> 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 I 
my old buddy. <laughs> and I'm thinking, please don't tell my security services about this one, okay? And a year after the program ended, um, the Russians sent this certificate. Um, and I want to read you what it says on there as, as uh, closely as, as I can. This given certificate is in confirmation of your ability to cope with all difficulties and extreme situations similar on the character of flood, fire, earthquake, volcano eruption, <laughs> marriage, or family life. <laughs> Let us congratulate you on your marriage. At last it happened. We congratulate your bride on very good taste. We swear before her and before the God that she has chosen a very reliable man to herself as a husband. Wishing you happiness and good luck through all family life. And it's signed by the chief designer, Alexander Pukov. I think I broke the cultural barrier. Thank you. Sorry, it took longer than I expected to, or I, as long as I feared, but longer than I expected to. But uh, anyway, I have time for a few questions if anybody's still awake. My question on Emma, did you make any reference to the fact that Emma was pregnant when she died? Did you make any significant measurements in the inlet, since that is such an important factor in high-speed flight? It's, it's as much important, maybe more so, than the engine itself. Well, we took a number of, of measurements. Uh, there, were, there were pressures and temperatures in the inlet. We also tried to measure the fuel flow. We were using an acoustical sensor, which I arranged um, to bring there. That wasn't very successful because the noise environment, the acoustical environment of the engine was just too much. for the, This acoustical sensor would have worked OK in an engine test stand, but it wasn't working in, in the flight. Um, I'm not an expert in any of the actual results of the data that were gathered. Uh, there were some reports that were published at that time, but I, I, don't, I don't know what the quality of those were considered to be. I wonder also about dynamic measurements as contrasted with static measurements of pressure. Did, did you get high frequency pressure measurements on anything? Uh, we did. I'd have to go back and look to see what the frequencies were of those. Um, but I don't know that right off the top of my head. Terry. You, you neglected to mention, talk about the mugging. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, it wasn't my mugging. <laughs> but, but what happened was um, I found a Dictionary of, Ameri of, uh, of Russian obscenities uh, in a bookstore here uh, in the States, which I took with me to Moscow. And one of my colleagues uh, from Langley took great delight in reading off different parts of that to our driver on the way to the airbase. Um, I, I have to tell the, the Steve story now that you open that Pandora's box. Steve, um, in one day talking with the, with the chief designer, the chief designer said something, and he uttered a phrase which basically meant up yours. <laughs> and the chief designer thought that was hysterically funny. <laughs> Steve became his best friend. This is really cool that he's able to, to swear at us in, his, in, his, in, in Russian. So Steve was feeling really good about this. and. Next day or two, he had occasion to use the same phrase with another Russian, nearly got called out to a duel. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, one of my interpreters wanted to borrow my dictionary when I went back home one time. And the next time I came back, he met me at the airport and he had, uh, he had black eye and he had cuts over his eye and he had, he was, his face had obviously been messed with. And I said, what happened? He said, I got mugged. He said, I'm sorry to tell you that you know, they took my briefcase and your dictionary of Russian obscenities was in the briefcase. I said, no, no, it's too bad. I'm sorry to hear that you got mugged. He said, but I felt so bad about that. He went out and he bought another 
Russian Obscenities Dictionary in Moscow that was published in Russia. So now I had a dictionary that had the Russian expressions and the literal English translations, <laughs> which often made no sense whatsoever. <laughs> So I actually traded up you know, <laughs> at, at his expense. Any other questions? I have a question. Yes. Here you go, sir. So um, related to the Tupelo, the blackjack versus the B1, just wondering if, if you can add an opinion, you know, just being in that environment and working with people associated with that company. I, I've had some just sort of security training where they, they kind of drive home the point of, you know, keeping a secret by showing the image of the B1 and the Tupolev blackjack. Mm. And just sort of like, see, be quiet, otherwise, you know, this is what happens. And I, I'm wondering if over there, is the opinion quite reversed? Do, does, does the aerospace community over there think that we copied the Tupolev designs with our B1? So is it? I've never heard anybody express that opinion um, over there. Um, that wasn't weighing on their minds if it was. I, I saw the Buran, which is the Russian space shuttle, which was quite clearly <laughs> very similar to the, the one we put up. Um, and they are sensitive to thinking that, uh, that they copied some of our designs, like with the Concorde. Um, but uh, the, remember that the, the industry there was hurting, and they were looking for a customer base. And we represented their best hope at a customer base. They were, they were hoping to continue this project after phase two, and as I say, that, that didn't happen. The Russians had actually invested some of their own money in this refurbishment. We didn't pay for the entire thing. They, they put a, a fair amount of money into their own refurbishment efforts. Um, but security was not, uh, was not a real key factor. Uh, the only problem I had with security was, was trying to find ways of passing my information back to the states that our, that our growing IT security infrastructure would put up with. Because every time I came up with a method, they'd say, oh, we don't really like that. So I'd come up with something else, and so I'd get some more data transfer. Oh, we don't like that one either. So I was always trying to keep a step ahead of the restrictions that were put on me for actually getting the information out of Russia back to the United States. Christian. Was the data mutually shared with the Russians? Yes. I mean, I got the data from them. I mean, when I, the, the data files off the aircraft, I got from the Russians. We originally went with a flight data recorder. We eventually used a Russian a PC, basically, that captured the data in, uh, in commutated form. So that was the raw information I got. All the calibration files I got for the parameters I got from the Russians who calibrated them. Uh, they typically did their own data analysis from their own systems, but I had the data that uh, uh, was translated and used by the American team. So it was a complete sharing of data. It was their aircraft, sometimes sensors that, uh, often sensors that we bought, but they installed. So it was, a real, it was a real collaborative effort. It was, like I say, it was unique. At the time, we had some space station activity going on in Moscow, and I'd run across, you know, Goddard people and JSC people. In fact, I didn't tell a story about the Abbey Express, which I often took, uh, that originated in Houston, that kind of puddle jumped across the Atlantic as a charter flight. But this was the only, the only game for aeronautics, and it was a complete sharing of data. By the way, I'm, my plan is to produce a memoir about this program. This is a kind of the surface of what's, <laughs> what's going to be in the book, because there's just a lot of, you figure if you spend four or five years in a place, there's a lot of stories that come out of it, and I'm trying to capture those. Anything else? Yes. Thank you, 
Glenn, I'm curious if you keep up with the, the people you met over there, the, you know, the colleagues, and do you have a desire to go back? And, and if you do, why? Well, first of all, I, I have not maintained uh, communication with the people there. It was initially very, very, very difficult to do that. Uh, they often did not have uh, uh, email addresses or electronic communication. I did keep up with one of my interpreters for a little while, but it was, it was difficult to do that um, for various reasons, some of which I don't understand but suspect. Um, um, <clears throat> One of my relatives once said, never get good at something that you don't want to be doing. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> it was a once in a lifetime experience. <laughs> and once is probably enough. I mean, I, I would like to go back. I never did get to St. Petersburg, for example. I always, I got a visa, because in, in Russia, you got visas for the city you were visiting. If I wanted to visit two cities, I had to have a visa that included both cities on it. And I actually got a visa that included St. Petersburg, but to get there, it's like, I don't know, about a six, seven hour um, ride on a train, and I kept hearing horror stories about people getting, getting gassed and robbed on the train and so forth. And I was by myself, and so I was a little reluctant to travel around too far from the fort in that environment. But I always regretted that I never, never made it up to St. Petersburg. And I would like to see how some things have changed now, but... Um, all this was, uh, was pre-Putin Russia, just barely. And one thing I discovered is that Russians really respect a strong leader, uh, regardless of where they come from. Uh, the, uh, the Secretary of State at the time, Madeleine Albright, who also spoke Russian because she was from Czechoslovakia, uh, they respected her because she was regarded as a strong leader. So that transcended gender as well as, as nationality, although there are some interesting gender-related stories uh, that you can ask Lori Losey about sometime. <laughs> the, the Russian views about access to aircraft immediately before a flight did not include the concept of allowing women on board, and that was a tough nut to crack. One of the technicians, Donna Gallagher, had the same issue. And I had to argue vociferously in some meetings to get them to allow that to happen because they were just critical for what we needed to do. So. Bob. I'd add just <clears throat> add one perspective that I saw. You know, I was a, a little different from Glenn's because I was an experimenter and, you know, so lots of us experimenters um, but Glenn, you know, is uh, responsible for the instrumentation system, which is critical to all the experiments. Much more, much more critical. Lots of the experiments canceled or, or dropped out along the way. Uh, you know, Dryden had undertaken the the most visible and high high. You know, if, if they had failed, the whole uh, the whole effort would have been a bust. And um, you know, I did I did get uh, was over early on in the f development of it. You know, designing the experiments and uh, went back several times. And I will say that you can't. You know, it's hard to overstate how politically valuable this project was. When it started out, it was at the height of you know trying to build technical relationships with Russia after the Cold War and yeah. space station cooperation was big. But this one was near term and uh, had a lot of quick payback. And uh, the high point politically for all of this was the rollout ceremony, which was a joke technically. It was, you know, the plane was badly painted, didn't have an engine in it, but there were people from every one of those organizations. They sent vice presidents, big name uh, managers out for this, uh, and uh, you know, watching it as an engineer, they were all jockeying for position, and uh, you know, who's going to sit where? And after that rollout ceremony, they disappeared. You never saw them again. And, um, and truly, at that point on, the, the people who made the project work were Glenn and um, one other name to go was Russ Barber, it was the other uh, other person who, you know, rolled up his sleeves, you know, kind of an unsung hero. And, uh, you know, uh, that's, that's how the project really got worked. And I thought, um, you know, with all the organizations you show up there, Dryden's the tiniest one 
but that's what you know that's what Dryden or Armstrong really does well. They actually made it work, and I think you know I think they really uh, Glenn you know really made the center look good, and really more than that, probably made the whole the whole national team look good. We would have uh, there were a lot of high idealism going into it, and um, you know a lot of it could have fallen apart if we hadn't we hadn't come through on it. So. <coughs> Oh, thanks, Bob. I'll, I'll pay you later. <laughs> okay.